name is Melissa Dodd. I am associate pastor here, and I, I was asked this week, they've made the point that Andy always says, I'm one of the pastors, and I always say I am the associate. That's so we know where the buck stops. <laughs> but it's got that, right? We are in the second week of a sermon series over David, as Jill pointed out. We're going to be talking about David and Goliath, and this morning's scripture comes from 1 Samuel 17, 38 through 49. Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped Saul's, Saul's sword over the armor, and he tried in vain to walk, for he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I'm not used to them. So David removed them. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the wadi, and put them in his shepherd's bag in the pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine came on and drew near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? But the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the army of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day... The Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give, you the dead bo- give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air, to the wild animals of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know the Lord does not save by sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into my hand. When the Philistine drew near to meet David, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. This is the word of God for the people of God. At this point in the timeline of David, he's not a warrior. He's a kid, as Jill Jill pointed out. He's We don't exactly know how old he is. We're guessing probably a tween or a middle schooler. But we know he'd never been in battle. We know that he maybe had taken peanut butter and jelly sandwiches to his brothers who were on the front line. But he was at home watching the family sheep. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm sure that he had learned some things on the hills as he protected the sheep from their predators. I'm sure he developed bravery as he fought off that which would attack himself or his sheep. We get a little glimpse of the hazards of being a shepherd, just in case you were considering it as a vocation this morning. never know. Out of uh, chapter 17, verse 33, Saul said to David, You're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you're just a boy, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And whenever a lion or a bear came and took the lamb from the flock, I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down, and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears. Oh, my. (laughs) Check and see if you're listening. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them since he has defied the armies of the living God. So it should come as no surprise that David says, bring it on to his 10-foot giant. It is said that Goliath was 10 feet tall. But I imagine that David had some gumption. Don't you like that word, gumption? I mean, think about it. David was the youngest of eight boys. You know that he had gotten to where he wasn't taking a lot of flack without knowing he needed to step up. And oh yeah, by the way, he was the chosen one. 
Last week, Andy talked to us about the fact that David had been chosen by God, anointed by Samuel to replace Saul as king. Even at an early age. I know. It's going to be your time. She's so cute. Even at an early age, David was known for having a heart after God. But what stood out for me when I, when I listened to this story was how David took the simplest of things into battle. He didn't need no stinking arm, armor. He went to face his giant with some rocks. We would have grabbed that, the king's armor with both hands for protection. But David steps in with some rocks. Some rocks he had picked up from a riverbank to meet his Philistine. How foolish to think that a simple river rock was going to make a difference before a giant. I mean, there was nothing impressive about these rocks. There was nothing that you and I would see that would say this could take down a giant. But David and God knew that it would. Because don't miss what David really does take into battle that day. You come against me with sword, spear, and javelin, David says, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. He doesn't even seem to mention the rocks. Often what comes at us doesn't come with a sword or a spear, but it still takes its swipes at our livelihood, at our family, and in the process often takes a notch out of our faith. Alcoholism, addiction, adultery, and that's just a few of the A's. But the giants that come before us are always covered in fear. And we step up against this giant, and we're often brushed to the side like David was when Goliath says, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? So we gather up everything we can. Everything that the world says makes sense to fight against whatever it is that's coming at us. To make sure we look like we have it together. We put on that armor to face the oppression, the struggles, the battle. And it's all simply a stick to a dog. Yet God often uses the simplest of things in the biggest battles of our lives. And we can miss it because we're so busy trying on the armor that the world says will fit. We get our hands on everything we can because it seems to make sense. What is it that we are discounting because it seems like a simple river rock? But if we were to place it, if we were to have trust it could unleash incredible power, God's power. The truth being that it's a little crazy to think that we can go into battle simply in the name of the Lord. But what is it that in the midst of an obstacle, the world says will fit at that moment? What is it that we try on and it doesn't fit, but we still try to walk around in it? We still try to, to pull that sword out because that's what we're supposed to do. Because going into our battle in the name of the Lord just doesn't seem like enough. So we have to try some other things. We have to strap that armor on. What is it that you, what is it that we go into battle with? I'm a fixer. I've known that about myself for years. Do I have any other fixers out there? We just got to fix it. There are no other fixers. I'm alone in this. Okay, thank you. I have a little bit of interaction in the back row. Appreciate that. Now, I'm a fixer. I, I want to fix it. doesn't matter what it is. I'm going to try to fix it. If it's in my life or it's in somebody else's life, I'm going to do my best to try to fix it. Now, I know most of the time, I, I know I can't fix it because it's not for me to fix. But doggone it, I sure want to. You know what I mean? Yeah, so I, I, I'm so busy. I'm, I'm trying to be busy, trying to try on armor or, or suggest armor plates for other people or what sword they should take into battle that I can miss God moving in that situation. I can miss 
God being a part of that battle because I'm so busy going, let's try on this armor. When I think about my own discipleship in this story, I would not have been David and boldly said, I don't need no stinking armor. I would have been more like Saul, suggesting exactly how to put that armor on. But God had another plan. And God has another plan for our lives. David knew that God had another plan. God knew that happened at second, too. You'd think I'd learn. David knew that armor would not be needed. Paul writes some words in Ephesians that, that I think had it been available to David a couple thousand years earlier, David would have probably have, have read this, had this tattooed on his arm or something. These words out of the book of Ephesians, 6th chapter, verses 10 through 17, are powerful words about the armor that we should go into battle with. And I'm reading out of the message version because it seems to just nail it. And I'm also thinking I probably should have brought glasses into this battle. (laughs) Not wanting to admit it. God is strong. And he wants you strong. So take everything the master has set out for you. Well-made weapons of the best materials and put them to use. So you'll be able to stand up to everything the devil throws your way. This is no afternoon athletic contest that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This is for keeps, a life or death fight to the finish against the devil and his angels. Be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get. Every weapon God has issued so that when it's all over but the shouting, you'll still be on your feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation are more than words. Learn how to apply them. You'll need them throughout your life. God's word is an indispensable weapon. In the same way, prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare. David knew that God was calling him to this moment of crisis and that physical armor was not going to be needed. Goliath had strutted back and forth, day in and day out, before this Israel army. For 40 days, the army had lost hope, but David had not. Maybe before your giant. Maybe before that thing in your life or those things in your life, maybe you've lost hope. Maybe you need somebody else to step in and be your David. Now, I was thinking about this this weekend and, and the times in my life where I have needed somebody to step in between me and my giant. Because I had given up or I had lost hope. And I, I remembered something that happened this week, and, and I had just had one of those moments where, okay, I need to admit, it wasn't really much of a giant. It was more of like a Snow White and a Seven Dwarf. It was like a dwarf giant. So it was not a big deal. Okay, this, this past week, the, this giant, we'll call it a dwarf giant. This dwarf giant, it, it just kind of just showed up again, you know, and I was like, oh, come on. I'm, I'm getting, this is getting old. Can we just move on? You know, and I just, I was frustrated. I had lost hope that there was really going to be any change in this situation. And a friend of mine stepped up. He was my David for me, and he he prayed over that situation. And I watched God move in me, and I watched God move in my heart. You know, I I was busy trying on armor, trying to figure out how I was going to take this dwarf giant down. But I had a friend who was my David who said, no, we're going to pray over it. Which sometimes when you're frustrated, you really don't want to hear. You know what I mean? But I knew I needed to, you know. I needed somebody to step in and be my David. Maybe you're there. Maybe you've got a giant in your life and you've lost hope. You need to ask for somebody to be your David. And now, maybe you need to be somebody's David. 
Yeah, it works that way too. Maybe right now in your life, you're being called to be somebody's David, to have that hope, to step in between them and their giant. Do you need a David or do you need to be a David right now? It takes a lot to, to trust God enough to cast away the armor. The armor that we've put our trust in is protection. To drop the facade that we carry that looks like we got it all together. To cast that away and to pick up our stone. And to say to that giant or those giants, I don't think you're going to take me down on this round in the name of the Lord. You're not going to bust up my family without a fight in the name of the Lord. You're not going to cause strife or division on my watch in the name of the Lord. Or this sin is not going to have the last say in the name of the Lord. Whatever giant or giants are on the horizon, or maybe it's clear right now, don't look down the hill. Listen to the boldness of David. This little guy came at his 10-foot giant with, this very day, he says, the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head. I don't remember that from the children's book. But, <laughs> but what bold declaration. What an incredible declaration from a non-experienced in battle middle schooler. We can have that kind of determination before our giants. No, it is not easy. I'm not naive. My life has not given me that prerogative. It is not easy to face our giants. That's why sometimes we need our another David to step in. But what is it that we are carrying into battle? I think sometimes we carry into battle a genie's lamp. And we just want to rub it and have God make it all go away doesn't work that way. I wish it did. As your pastor, I wish it did. I wish that when we received Jesus Christ as our Savior, we got a genie's lamp. But we don't, because we live in a broken world. But what is it that you take into battle? Because David was ready for battle in the name of the Lord. He was a young man who knew what it meant to be in relationship with his Lord. He didn't call on God at that moment before his Philistine because God was already there. I think if David had been at Campbell, his rocks would have been labeled worship, faith formation, mission, generosity, hospitality. If you're a member at Campbell, does that ring any bells? I believe that David, yes, was on his discipleship process. He was doing his staircases. I believe that David was picking up things in his journey that brought him faith in the name of the Lord. You know, we we pick up bitterness along the journey. We think we can go to our giant and just be angry at our giant, and that's going to take the giant down. Have you all tried that? I have. It doesn't work. And then sometimes we think, well, let's just pick up happiness, and let's just bring a lot of things around us that make us happy. And then when we face our giant, the happiness will just make the giant, poof, disappear. I've tried that too. It doesn't work. What is it that we are carrying into battle? What is it that we're picking up? Because let me tell you, if it's not in the name of the Lord, it's just getting in the way. If it's not some of those things that Paul mentions in Ephesians, truth, righteousness, God's word, prayer, then it's just awkward fitting when we get ready for battle. It just gets in the way. The sword is too heavy if it's not in the name of the Lord. We don't need no stinking armor. We have the rock. 
Would you please pray with me? Lord, you know that life is not easy. You know better than we do that we live in a broken world that has hurt and pain, and there are giants before us. Lord, empower us. Strengthen us. Bring us an understanding of what it is we are to take into battle. And Lord, if we are, are being called to be someone's David, guide us. Bring us wisdom and discernment. And Lord, if we need somebody to come in and be our David, will you help us to, to shred the armor, the facade, and just to ask for help? For Lord, you call us to more than mediocrity. You call us to boldness. And we lift that to you in hope and prayer. Through your Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.